The scripture reading this morning is from uh, the Gospel of John. Um, the Gospel of John, chapter 17. Very famous, well-known chapter um, where Christ is praying what we call the High Priest Prayer. The Gospel of John, chapter 17. This is God's holy, infallible word. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, and thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou, have, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept my, thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they, may, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou givest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. In them, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved me as thou hast loved, loved them as hast thou loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou, hast, for thou loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. May the Lord bless these words to our souls.
this morning. Let's open again the Gospel of John, chapter 17, and we will read a few verses uh, from this glorious chapter. Especially the last part of it, starting from verse 20. The Gospel of John, chapter 17, the verses 20 through 26. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect, in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may, be behold, may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. And they have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Uh, what, a, what a blessing to have leaders, Christian leaders in our lives. To have mentors, to have spiritual fathers. Uh, it's a great blessing. We learn from them. We cherish their, uh, their love to us. We go and ask them for counseling. And many times we would share our struggles, our questions, and we would ask them to pray for us. And it's, it's a great blessing. I have a mentor in Egypt who has been my mentor for 12 years now. And what a, what a blessing to, say, to have such a man in my life. Help me, guide me in many spiritual struggles, pray with me, pray for my ministry. What a blessing. And here we are before a prayer. The prayer of the greatest man ever lived on this earth. He's praying. Jesus Christ. And this prayer is the longest prayer recorded for him. We, we have other prayers for Christ in the Bible, we, we often read, he went to the mountain and prayed. Sometimes we have some words of other prayers, like when he raised Lazarus in John 11, he prayed. But this prayer is a very long prayer, and not only very long prayer, it was in a very special time. The one who worked in all the leaders that you may know, all the ministers and ambassadors, you may know, the, world who, the one who worked in their lives. Those great people that you would be proud of or be proud of being a follower of them. This is the one who worked in all of them. And he's, he's praying. And praying in a very special night. I would say this is the most important night all over human history. Few hours before being crucified. What a prayer. Think of this, the most important person in the most important time, and he's praying. And not only he's praying, he's praying for those who believe. Listen to these words in verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone. Who are these that he's referring to? These are the disciples, the, the 11 disciples. He's saying, I'm not just praying for these. The previous part of the prayer, he was praying for them. And we can apply it to us as well. But here, clearly he's saying, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Maybe those whom the disciples preached for, those who listened to the disciples in the book of Acts, he's praying for them, but not only them. 
He is praying for those who believed me through their word. In fact, we are reading the words of one of them. And we believed in Christ because of these words of these disciples. When you read the Gospel of Matthew, when you read the Gospel of John, when you read the Gospel of Luke, when you read these Gospels, you are reading the words of the, of the apostles. And you believed, if you believe in Christ, you believe because of these words. So if you, if you have believed in Christ because of the words that you have read in the Bible, this prayer is particularly for you. In the most important night, from the most important person ever, Jesus Christ. How important would this prayer be? So our goal this morning is that we would focus what was, pray, what was Jesus asking for in this very special night. And we'll see two main points. The goal of this prayer, what, what he was praying for. He was praying for unity, and he was praying for consummation, glorification. Let's, let's first see the first prayer, or the first goal, prayer for unity. And as we come to this prayer, have this scene in your, in your mind. If you remember the, in the Old Testament, the high priest would come to the, to the, to the holy one, the holy of holies, with with the names of the tribes of Israel on his chest and on his shoulders and would come to the presence of the Lord to lift his prayers for his people. And Christ is coming as a high priest with the names of those who will believe, the believers, and those who will ever believe. He's coming with their names and praying for them. The first point. Prayer for unity. We'll see this starting from verse 20, 21. And we'll see three things in unity. First of all, how does this unity look like? What, does it, what, what kind of unity is that? What is the unity that Christ is praying for, for his people? For us today, for those who are in Christ. How did this unity look like? Well, he's saying that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. The first thing in this unity, the first thing that how it looked like, it looks like the unity between the Father and the Son. This is incomprehensible. Amazing. That the unity, that, that the kind of unity that Christ is praying for, to cure, to, to, to take place in the church, between the believers, it's the kind of the unity between the Father and the Son with everything that it may mean. Love, fellowship, everything the, 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 the Father is doing, He's doing through the Son, by the Spirit. In the economy of salvation, the, son, the Father sent the Son and the Son submits to the Father. Everything is being done together in harmony, in love, this is what, what, what John himself is saying about the work between the Son and the Father earlier in the Gospel. All things were made through him. All things were made through the Son. The Son would say, the Father who dwells in me does the work. Harmony, love, no conflict. Same will, same mind. And Christ is saying, this is what we call the archetypal unity. And our unity is what we call ectypal. It's according to this kind of unity. This is the kind of unity that should be in the church between God's people. So the first thing on, on how does it look like, it's like the Father and the Son. But not only this, this, he's saying that they also may be one in us. It is not just a unity Similar to the unity between the Father and the Son, it is a unity in the Trinity. Because ma many people may, may have kind of unity, by the way. Uh, people in the same syndicate will have kind of unity. Those who, who love certain, uh, 
sports club or something like that. They have a kind of unity. Uh, Jehovah Witnesses have unity. Muslims have, win have unity. Um, even um, some sinners in doing very, very obnoxious things. They have a kind of unity. They agree on something. And you may find some love between them. Not love in, in its deepest sense, of course, but there's kind of unity between them. But the unity that Christ is praying for is not any unity. It is a unity in the Trinity. It is a unity that is related to be in the Father and the Son and in the Holy Spirit. It's not a unity apart from them. It's a unity linked and defined by the Trinity. Two chapters earlier, Christ said that I am the vine and you are the branches. And what does this mean? One of the things that, that it, may, it may signify that these branches, they get their life from the vine. So a church that claims to be in unity without being in the Trinity, there's no life there. And all kinds of unity that you may see in the world, there's no life there. Because life comes from God himself. So it's a unity similar to the Trinity, a unity in the Trinity. But further he would say, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The third characteristics or the, th the third characteristic of this unity is that it's not a hidden unity. It's not, it's not a secret unity. It's a unity that the world may see it. There's a kind of a mission in this unity. It's something when the world will see, will say, aha, this is different. These people are different. This group is different. The way they treat each other is different. The way they love each other is different. By this, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another, the world we know, the people around us, not only the church may feel it, may feel we are enjoying this, but we are hiding that. No, it's something that the world, when they come and see, they would see something different. I have heard yesterday from Ellen and Paul, that you are doing ESL uh, classes. What a blessing. What, what, a, what, a, what a chance. And people will come to the church and they are learning, but they are also watching. They are watching. Even without saying anything. They are hearing your witness with their eyes. They see what you, how, how you treat each other, how you love each other, how you sacrifice for each other, how you may forgive for each other. And Christ is saying that the world may know, may see, may believe that thou has sent me. So this is how the unity look like. But the, the, the coming question, how is this unity achieved? How can we reach this unity, or how, how can this unity take place? Well, he's saying in verse 22, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So Christ is saying he has given to the disciples the glory that he has taken from the Father. What does it mean that he has given them the glory. Well, to be part of this unity, to join this unity, you have to receive the glory from the Son. What does it mean to receive the glory? To see the glory of the Son. To see who the Son is. In the beginning of the gospel, in, gospel, in the gospel of John chapter 1, this is how Paul introduced the gospel. He would say, we have seen his glory. Glory as the only Son from the Father, full of, grace, full of grace and truth. In order to join this unity, in order to be part of the church, in order to 
to say, I am one of these that Christ was praying for. It means that you have seen the glory of God in Christ. Would you explain more? What does it mean to see, to see the glory? Well, to, to know who Christ is. To see his beauty. To see his mercy, his love, his grace, his holiness. Christ revealed his glory. He came and revealed his glory. And many of, the, of those who met him, they would say, he's the son of carpenter. And that's it. They didn't see the glory. You may have been in the church for years and years. And you did not see the glory. You have not encountered the glory. When you see the glory of Christ, every other glory will be nothing. You will count Christ more worthy with no comparison with anything else. He would call the disciples. He would call a tax collector. Come and follow me. And the text says he just left everything and followed him. Because he found Christ more glorious than anything else. Is Christ more glorious than anything else to you? Than your job? Than your house? than your family, than your ministry? Is, 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 is the glory of Christ is the greatest thing that you would cherish and, and enjoy and worship? So to see, to, to see the glory of Christ means that you are part of this, of this prayer, part of this, of this unity. Listen to these words from Gospel of John chapter 1. He came to his own. He came to his own. And his own people did not receive him. But all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. This is another title of being in this unity. To be called a child of God. Those who, has, those who have received Christ. Members in, in this unity. Members in this household, those who have seen the glory of Christ. Paul in, the, in 2 Corinthians, he said, before knowing Christ, before knowing Christ, the, the prince of this world has blinded my eyes. And those who are not believing, they are blinded. They don't see the glory of God in Jesus Christ. But the one who who, who said, let there be light, has shown in our hearts to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Only then you'll be part of this unity. You'll be in this body. You'll be one of those whom Christ is praying for. So how, how, can, we, how can we part of this unity? Beholding the glory of Christ. And every time, every time you come to the church, every time you listen to the word preached, every time you listen to Christ preached, Christ is being revealed. And every time you come, ask him, Lord, open my eyes to see your glory. I need to see more of your glory. But not only this, he say this, it happens, Christ is saying it in another way, how this unity is achieved. He's saying it happens through a mediator. And it has been said very beautiful here. If you see verse 21 and verse 23, there's a kind of an equation. If you love equations, you will see it. He's saying that, Thou Father art in me, and I in thee. There's a unity here. You, the Father, you are in me, and I in thee. And then in verse 23, he is saying, I in them, and thou in me. Thou here refers to the Father. So you'll see two things here. When, like, you are in me in verse 23. And verse 21, he said, the Father is in me. But in 21, he is saying, I in the Father, I in thee. 
and in 23 he's saying, I in them. So the Father is in him, in both verses, but in one verse he would say, I am in the Father, and in the other he would say, I am in them. Without Christ, there is no unity with God. He is the mediator. He is the priest, the prophet, the king. With, without Christ, there is no unity with God. Without Christ, people are in enmity with God. He's the only mediator between human beings and God. If there is a way to him, to God, it must be through Christ. That's why we say we have to preach Christ every time we come to the church, every time we preach the gospel. We have to lift Christ. Christianity is not about do and do not. It comes after that, out of love. But primarily it's about being in Christ or not. Have you seen him or not? Are you approaching to God in Christ or not? Every time we come to the church, we come, we lift our prayers, we worship because of him, because of this mediator. You know, sometimes I, uh, when after, after serving, after doing, after having a good week, I would look forward to Sunday, to the Lord's Day, to come and kind of, I'm happy this last week was good. And I feel kind of confident. And in other weeks, where things were not so good, there was some weakness, struggles. I would come to the church on Sunday and Try, kind of trying to hide myself, putting my eyes down, and I feel I'm, I'm not worthy of being here. And you may think your performance last week would, would make a difference. Well, whether it was a good week or a bad week, whether you were obedient or not, the only reason we are here, the only reason we are accepted, is the mediator, is Jesus Christ, his righteousness, not ours, not ours. How this unity would be achieved through the Son, through the mediator. But now what is the goal of this unity? What, why this is unity is important. Now, verse 23. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. That the world may know that thou hast sent me. As we said briefly, it's a mission. When, when this unity happens, when, when the people of God come together, gather together, when they come to worship together, when they live in this unity, the world would understand something. And not just understand that these people, they love each other. When we come together, what we do, we worship this son. We glorify his name. We talk about his death and resurrection for us. We talk about him. And when the world see this throughout 2,000 years so far, the world, we, God has sent his son. You know, it, it's amazing. I have traveled many countries in the world. And has been privileged by, with worshiping and, or by worshiping with many believers. And it's amazing, all the believers all over the world in different places, in different times, they are doing the same thing. They are singing the same words, reading the same words, thanking God for the same thing, had, having the same struggles with sin, longing for the same hope. Amazing. We are speaking similar language. I would come here, worship with you, and I don't feel a foreigner. And if you come to my church in Alexandria, you will not feel a foreigner. You will feel, you'll feel that you are with your people, with a family. How would you know this? How this would happen? Because the Lord has sent his son. He has sent his son. And that's why we are doing this in different places, in different cultures, different times. But not only that, 
that the world may know that you have sent me and thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. When people, they see us, when they see the love that is in us, when they will see that we are forgiving each other, we are helping each other, we are rejoicing with each other, we mourn with each other. And by the way, rejoicing with each other is even harder than mourning with each other. To rejoice when other people succeed is very hard. Only the Spirit can do this in our lives. And they, when the people, they see this, they say, these people are not normal. It is God's work in them. God loves them. And that's why they are doing this. They will see the transforming power of God in their lives. So they will know that thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. The, the effect of your love in their lives will be obvious, clear in their lives. People can tell they are different. They are the beloved. They are the beloved. Beautiful unity. What a prayer. But let's see what is the second thing that Christ is praying for in these few verses. He's praying for consummation. Verse 24 to 26. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou hast loved me before the foundation of the world. First of all, he's saying this. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me. And we, I can't just leave this few words. What are the believers? What are those who are in the unity? They are a gift from the Father to the Son. Think of this. If you are in Christ... You are a gift from the Father to the Son. Who can snatch, who can take a gift given from the Father to the Son? No one. The one who can do this must be mightier, stronger than both the Father and the Son. No one can do this. I will that thee also do has, thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. And here, interestingly, Christ is saying, I want them to see my glory. We just said that they already have seen thy glory. John himself said, we, we beheld his glory. Glory as the one from, coming from the Father. How can we reconcile this that you were saying, well, we have seen the glory. Paul said, the Lord shone in our hearts to see, to behold the glory of God in Jesus Christ. And now you are saying, I want them to behold my glory. Yes, yes. Because what you have seen now, whatever it was, whatever glorious it is, whatever deep it is, you will see more. What you know now about Christ, no matter how glorious it is, will not be compared with that day when you will see him face to face. Are you longing to this day to see him as he is, face to face? If now the glory overwhelms you, if now the glory captures your heart, it will be, it cannot be compared with what we will see one day. We will know him in a different way, with no veil with no glory mirror. Listen to what John is saying in 1 John. I know you have been studying 1 John. 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we, we shall see him as he is. As he is. Amen. We look forward to this day, O oh Lord. And Christ is praying, I'm praying that they will come to me to see my glory. 
in its fullness. He's praying for our glorification, that one day we will be transformed completely and to be like him. If you are amazed now with the glory of Christ, it cannot be compared with the amazement on that day. Somewhere Rutherford wrote this hymn long time ago. Uh, the time, the, the, uh, the sands of time are sinking. And he wrote these words, one of the, one of the stanzas said this, O Christ, he is the fountain, the deep, deep well of love. The streams on earth I have tasted, more deep I will drink above. There be, there to an ocean fullness, his, mirth, his mercy doth expand, and glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. We have tasted something. We have, we have tasted of the streams, but more deep I will drink above, more deep. And Christ is praying for that, that we may behold his glory in its fullness. And then he's praying another prayer for the future of this people, of his people. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Christ is not just praying for the final future, where we will see his full glory. But he's, he's praying for the future of the believers from now. So he's praying for your future today. He's praying for tomorrow, literally. For next month, for next year, for you. He's praying. This is, this is the... The subject of his prayer. But he's saying, O righteous Father, the world has not known thee. He's, he's praying for us, for our future, for every day in our lives, for these future days, in a, in a hostile world. He knows that we are living in a hostile world. In a world that has not known thee. What does it mean, has not known thee? Has not loved thee. Has not received thee. They received thee. They love thee, O oh Lord. The world did not. There is hostility. They will be facing hostility. Doubts will come. Struggles will come. The world will press hard on them. They will persecute them. They will not honor my name. They will not honor you, O oh Father. And they will, they will not honor them. Interestingly, Christ is saying these words, and just if you go to chapter 18, we will see how he will be trialed, he will be arrested, and he will be crucified. Persecution is right coming. And he's saying, if the world loved me, they would love, they would love you. And if they hated me, they will hate you. He knows, he knows that we'll be hated. He will, not, he will know that we will not be loved. And so he's praying in this hostile context, in the midst of this enmity. He's saying, I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it. I will keep revealing you to them. And he is. Every time you listen to the word every time you read the word and the Holy Spirit open your eyes to the glories of Christ, to who God is, to the glories of the gospel. Christ is fulfilling this promise. I am declaring your name to them. And I will keep doing this. Christ is promising his people that he will never stop declaring who he is to his people. It's not just some... Past experience that 20 years ago, 10 years, 10 years ago, you have, you have known the Lord, you have repented, you were regenerated, and that's it. He's saying, I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it. We'll keep doing this. And why this is important? Why this is important? That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them. When they see 
who you are, when, you, when they see the gospel, when they see you love in Christ, they will understand what does it mean for you to love them. And when you love them, when, when, when they grasp this love, they will be able to love you and love the others. See the dynamics? We can only love each other. We can only forgive each other. We can only sacrifice for each other. We can only serve each other. If the source of this love is not from us, when we see the love of God in Christ, only then we are enabled to love. So when we talk about the commandments, when we talk about the law, what is the law? What are the Ten Commandments? If I, if I summarize the law in two sentences, what I would say, love your God with all your strength, with all your mind, with all your heart, and love your neighbor as yourself. How can we do this? Only when we see the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Only when we see the love of God in Jesus Christ. Only when we see the mercy, the grace of God in Jesus Christ to us sinners. Every day, we are enabled to love each other. And this is what Christ is saying. I have declared unto them thy name. And will declare it. I will keep declaring thy name. He's promising. And if Christ promised, it's done. He doesn't lie. He never, he never lies. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them, and I in them. What a promise. I will continue to be in them. You know, uh, as I close, or as I come closer to my uh, conclusion, it's amazing that Christ was praying this prayer, and if you think of the church at this time, how it looked like, how the disciples looked like. A few hours later, maybe less, they would just flee. They would just run. Right? And Christ is not just praying for them, for these 11 week disciples. He is praying for those who will believe in them because of their words. Right? How many now believe because of these disciples, because of these words? For Christ, the mission of these 11 disciples was, was something that is, is going to be fulfilled. It is kind of done. And he's praying accordingly. He's praying for people in New Jersey in 2022. Based on a mission that will start 2,000 years earlier. Starting from these 11 disciples being persecuted with, with the Roman Empire, with the Jews. And for Christ, this mission or the success of this mission is something done. It's sure. And he's praying accordingly. He's, saying, he's not saying, if they preach and if things go well, would you do this? No. He's praying for those who will believe because of their words. He knew that they would be filled, that they would be filled by the Spirit. They would write the Gospels. They would write the Epistles. They will preach the Word. And the Word will go over the whole earth. And accordingly, he's praying. Two final questions. Are you part of this prayer? Would you consider yourself one of those who are mentioned in verse 20? Are you one of those who believed? Have you seen the glory of Christ? Have you tasted Christ? One of the most important, one of the evidences, one of the evidences that, the, that you would love the brethren, the world will see that you you cherish the church. You love the church. You love God's people. The world will see that your joy is in him. 
You're not coming to the church on Sunday because you have, you have to. You love to do this. It's a joy. And the people see this. Only those who are born again can do that. Only those who are born again. The, the world will see your joy in belonging to the church, in belonging to God and his people. The priority of God's kingdom will be clear in your life. This is one, one of the things. That, this is what the text is talking about here. That the world may know that they are in you and I in them. Are you part of this prayer? The second question that I will leave with you is, what are your priorities in prayers? This is Christ's prayer, right? In this very special night. This was his priority for his people. Unity, glorification, to see the glory of God day after day, to be changed day after day. These were the things that Christ was, was praying for at that time. His priority should shape our priority. What are, your, what are you praying for? Where your heart is going? What do you love the most? You know, one day a preacher said this. Imagine a woman, a mother, who has a sick child, badly sick. And she goes to the Lord to pray at the evening. What do you think she was going to pray for? She's going to pray for her child. That the Lord may touch him. He may get healing. Why? Because she loves her child. What you love is what are you praying for all the time. What do you really love? where your heart is taken. Christ prayed for his people, for the unity of his people. He loved his people. And he was praying for that they may see his glory and that they would, would change day after day in this hostile world. These were his priorities, that they may dwell in his presence. And this should be our prayer. This is what the psalmist say in Psalm 27. One thing I ask of the Lord, and that I seek to dwell in the house of the Lord, that I may behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. May this be our prayer too. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for, for the High Priest. We thank you for Jesus Christ, the one who knew no sin, but came to bear the sin of his people, the Lamb of God, the one who came to die, so that we may be called the children of God. We pray, O Lord, that you would open our eyes this morning to the glory of of Christ, to the love of Christ, to the grace of Christ, so that everything else may take its, its proper place, its right place, its right size. Lord, we, we worship things. We live for things. Open our eyes, O oh Lord, to see the, your glory so that we may worship the true God. And so that we may love each other and be in unity with each other. I pray for this church, O oh Lord, that they would enjoy the unity of being the children of God. And that the world around them may tell truly the, world, the Lord is in their midst. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.